Hi, this is Dr. Bernstein with our December 2015 teleseminar. We, uh, before we start, I want to remind you that my answers to questions are based on assumptions about the individual who asked the question, and my assumptions may be incorrect, and it could well be that I give some wrong answers. So I'm just warning you that these answers are guesses. They're not absolute answers, so uh, don't uh, uh, run out and do what I say, but discuss uh, the suggestions with your doctor. Uh, the special subject for today uh, is a new insulin that came on the market about two weeks ago that serves a special purpose. It's called Treseba. I just want to double check the spelling. T R E S I B A. And it uh, is a long acting insulin or basal insulin. The manufacturer claims that it will last for two days. I'm not interested in insulins lasting for two days, but we have a big problem with many type 1 diabetics where the basal insulin does not even last overnight if you inject it at bedtime. It's a problem for me and for almost every type 1 diabetic I have who is not making insulin. Uh, so I just spoke to a, a patient whom I've been treating for about uh, 15 years or so, and he makes a little bit of insulin. We measure his C-peptide levels, and he doesn't require this kind of special insulin. But for most of us uh, who don't make any insulin, and when they get up in the morning, they experience high blood sugars, this Traceba can be uh, of great value. I've, try I've tried it on about six patients so far, and I've only gotten results back on three of them. So far, it appears to be working. So I'm not absolutely sure yet. It looks that way, in which case you take a, a shot of Traceba at bedtime, and when you get up in the morning, uh, if the dose is right, you'll have a normal blood sugar without a peak overnight. Um, there's a question that comes up with any new product, especially injectable products. Uh, are there any adverse effects other than hypoglycemia from getting too much? And uh, we really don't know. Uh, this thing has been tested uh, for FDA trials for about three years, and I believe it's been in use outside of the USA for five years. So apparently, over a five-year period, they haven't found any uh, significant adverse effects. But just remember that the insulin called Lantus uh, began to show increased cancer incidence after many years of use. And uh, that, that takes a while. It takes probably 10 to 20 years of use before you see something like that. So we can't be absolutely assured that the Traceba is going to be totally benign. But when we have people who are waking up with elevated blood sugars or whom, for whom uh, an hour after they wake up in the morning, their blood sugar goes up, uh, the effect, the long-term effects of the high blood sugars could be very significant, and that's why we uh, take a liking to this new insulin. Uh, we don't use it if we don't have to. Although the manufacturer recommends one shot every two days, I give one shot twice a day. Uh, I've, have, I've had no evidence that it lasts for two days. Uh, these uh, wild claims are commonplace amongst insulin manufacturers, and uh, my guess is that you can take this twice a day and experience pretty flat basal blood sugars. Now we'll go on to the questions. First question, 20 weeks pregnant, insulin resistance is increasing dramatically. Would adding glucophage in addition to insulin uh, be safe? 
Well, glucophage has been tested. Glucophage is metformin. It's the brand name of metformin, which is, we found, much more effective than the generic versions of metformin. And uh, uh, clinical trials have found uh, metformin to be safe for pregnancy. But it is natural for insulin requirements to go up during pregnancy. Uh, the uh, pregnant woman is building fat in the early trimester, first trimester, uh, for use in the third trimester. So for the first trimester, part of the second trimester, you may be building fat. You're also building uh, an a fetus, and um, you need uh, more, not only more insulin, but the increased fat that you're storing is going to cause uh, insulin res resistance and requirements for more injective insulin. So this is not an unusual phenomenon. It's not a phenomenon that requires uh, metformin or something like that. Uh, it's natural. You expect insulin requirements to go up in the early parts of pregnancy, and then at the termination of pregnancy upon delivery, uh, insulin requirements plummet because you've lost, uh, you've not lost, but you've delivered the fetus and the placenta and uh, the causes uh, of, and all, over time you've used up some of that stored fat. So uh, you no longer have the insulin resistance. Now it could be that you went into the pregnancy obese and uh, your doctor wants you to lose weight, not gain weight during the pregnancy, which by the way happened with a number of the pregnant women that I've treated. In that case, there may be value to the metformin, but for a slim person, uh, I don't offhand see any use for it but no harm either. Type 2 male on Victoza with great results. A1C now 4.9. Increased dose to the maximum on Victoza and got more headaches even though I am not low. Are you Finding this in your patients, any suggestions? Well, first of all, I should point out that I do not use Victoza for the treatment of blood sugars in my patients. I use it to control overeating. If this person is a type 2 diabetic, he may be an overweight overeater, for all I know, in which case the Victoza could be of great value, and that may be why his blood sugars have come down. Um, now, as far as the headaches go, I've never seen headaches with Victoza, but uh, as you probably know, almost any m medication that's effective can have side effects. And uh, if you are getting side effects from Victoza, you may want to uh, lower the dose. And if lowering the dose raises your blood sugar, you may want to consider an alternate substance for reducing your carbohydrate cravings. For example, uh, as we mentioned in the book, there's Bieta and there are other uh, incretin mimetics that could be used. Uh, so uh, by substituting something else, for the carbohydrate cravings, you might uh, be able to lower the Victoza dose. Um, if you listen to the uh, video teleseminar on Dr. Bernstein's Diabetes University uh, about uh, appetite suppressants, you might get some other ideas uh, for appetite suppressants that will help you lower your Victoza dose. And at a future a session of this teleseminar, we will be talking about uh, a new uh, a 
amazing psychological device that can cur curb carbohydrate craving. Uh, next question. As I try to find fine tune my blood sugars on your program, I find that I'm having frequent lows because I do not have a regular work schedule. Some days I'm more active than other days. What is the best way to manage this? And are there any long-term effects of uh, frequent or prolonged periods of low blood sugar? And by low blood sugar, uh, he means 70 to uh, 70 milligrams per deciliter or less. Well, first of all, I don't know whether he's taking insulin or not, but what I, the first thing that I thought of uh, to help this person uh, relates to what I do in the gymnasium. When I go to the gym, I usually am taking my regular daily basal dose of insulin plus a rapid acting insulin before meals. Um, and uh, I, cur I get frequent lows after exercising. So uh, by that I mean after every exercise, I'll drop by something. I might drop by uh, two milligrams per deciliter from one exercise and as much as uh, 20 for uh, the opposite extreme of exercise. So I have to be frequently checking my blood sugar when I'm in the gym and correcting with liquid glucose. Now, if this person is sitting at work and all of a sudden he has to get up and start doing some physical activity in the, as part of the work, then he should be frequently checking his blood sugars. On the other hand, if one day he knows he's not going to be physically active and another day he will be physically active, he can lower his basal insulin dose on the active day. For example, let's say he's a telephone lineman and uh, uh, there are no lines to be repaired today, so he's going to be sitting in an office. Uh, if he knows this is going to happen, then that day he could take uh, more basal insulin than on a day that he's going to, knows he's going to be out repairing the lines. On the other hand, if he's sitting in the office and he doesn't know when he's going to be called, he probably should have a lot of liquid glucose available uh, that he can take with him, and he'll have to check his blood sugars and use the liquid glucose as needed. Um, by liquid glucose, I mean this sort of stuff that you can get at any drugstore. Uh, and uh, for me, one teaspoon will lower, will raise me by seven. Uh, someone who weighs uh, twice as much as I, one teaspoon will raise you by uh, three and a half. Um, the cap has a volume equal to a teaspoon. So you can pour it in the cap and use that to measure it. Next question. As I try to... F no, that's the wrong... That's the question I just asked. Let's see. Do you know of natural supplements or herbs to help preserve and or regenerate insulin. I have heard niacinamide and gymnema sylvestri assist in this. Uh, I don't know why you call these natural. Uh, they're both processed. The gymnema sylvestri could be contaminated with all kinds of other uh, vegetation that may grow with it. Uh, uh, so it, it looks like this person is looking for magic to treat the diabetes so that she doesn't have to uh, take it seriously and really look at blood sugars. I can list some things that have had effects, but none of them are available in, a, in formulations that give you predictable results. Each batch can be different. Uh, for example... There's benfotiamine, which has been reported in the scientific literature on a number of occasions, 
that might uh, help beta cells replicate. There's, uh, uh, but whatever amounts are available, it can't predict the effects. Uh, it's not like insulin. There's fenugreek, which has been used for years uh, to um, uh, lower blood sugars, not necessarily preserve beta cells. Um, but again, the results are unpredictable. On top of that, fenugreek, the original fenugreek has a horrible smell. People can't get near you if you use it, but there's now a uh, uh, desmellerized fenugreek available somewhere. Again, uh, uh, you don't get product predictable results, but uh, uh, you wanted a list, so here are some. Then there's vanadyl sulfate, which in some formulations is very effective. The big problem is that it's a phosphatase inhibitor, and uh, phosphatase is an enzyme that's important for many chemical reactions throughout the body, and you don't know what you're doing to your body's chemistry when you take it. So when clinical trials have been performed to evaluate vanadyl sulfate, uh, the um, investigators are afraid to use it for more than three weeks, not knowing what kind of long-term damage they're going to do. So I don't recommend any of these, but I'm answering your question. Next question. You said that you choose 83 milligrams per deciliter as a blood sugar target, in part because mortality rates were higher below and above that range. Does that mean one shouldn't aim for a target of, say, 77 to give a safer margin, margin of error, since above 85 is associated with increased um, uh, heart disease risk? Well, that's a very good question, and it's not an easy question to answer. I have several patients who, uh, especially those who don't require insulin, or type 2 diabetics, who respond to diet. And uh, many of them say, uh, I'm running around 75 or so, and I feel perfectly comfortable, comfortable and so on. Uh, uh, I don't want to raise my blood sugar target and eat more just to bring my blood sugar up. Um, good question. Uh, the one thing that I worry about is driving and operating uh, machinery that could be dangerous. So if a person is going to drive, I say, check your blood sugar before driving and bring it up to 83 uh, with the help of glucose. Um, if you're not driving and if you're used to being 77 or thereabouts, uh, you probably can get away with it. But there are plenty of people whom add a blood sugar in the 70s become a little bit irritable, um, less cooperative, and uh, uh, less pleasant to be with. So uh, there, there, uh, there are downsides. Uh, yet, perhaps there may be a little less cardiac risk, but the study, the long-term studies that have been done, of which I can recall only two, uh, show that one was for hemoglobin A1C, which corresponded to a blood sugar of around 85, and the other was for fasting blood sugars, which was around 83, that these two values uh, corresponded to lowest mortality, but below these values, there was higher mortality. So. It, it may not be the wisest thing in the world to be uh, shooting for lower and lower blood sugars below 85 or 83. Next question. I've been a type 1 diabetic for 25 years. Started on a statin 10 years ago. I followed your diet for the past nine months. My recent cholesterol test results are, and he gives some numbers. Uh, I ate two eggs every day. Why is my cholesterol so high? 
Well, first of all, if you've listened to the teleconferences or gone to Dr. Bernstein's Diabetes University or read my books, you know that cholesterol is not a predictor of heart disease. In fact, in one study on older women, the uh, lowest mortality was at a blood cholesterol of 217, uh, and mortality went up below that. Uh, so the um, uh, pseudoscientists who are not up to date with the literature and have been prescribing low cholesterol levels uh, certainly are making a mistake in the case of recommendations for women. And uh, it's something that I don't look at. I look at, uh, as, as you listeners know already, things like uh, inflammatory markers like C-reactive protein, fibrinogen, homocysteine, um, uh, beta-2 microglobulin, and uh, I look at oxidized LDL. I do look at triglycerides and HDL. All of these things have been found to correlate with uh, coronary artery disease, but not total cholesterol and not LDL. Um, now, why could the cholesterol, total cholesterol be going up? There could be uh, a number of reasons. Uh, one, if blood sugars were elevated, uh, and the elevated blood sugars uh, can cause um, immune markers to go up, uh, uh, maybe they're also, and, and of course, my blood, my cholesterol back in the old days when we actually measured it was sky high when I had high blood sugars and was on a high carbohydrate diet and then lowering the blood sugars brought it down. Now, one possibility for your cholesterol going up is we do know that when free T3, the thyroid hormone, is low, cholesterol goes up. In parallel with that, other risk factors for heart disease go up, uh, other real risk factors. So you might want to check your free T3. And uh, the free T3 could go up because you're eating less than you used to. I'm sorry, it could go down because you're eating less than you used to. Next question. I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, started using 30 units of insulin. Now I'm using 4 units of uh, Detamir or Levamir and no insulin for meals. My question is, will this extend the honeymoon period? Well, this is a person who should read my book because basically what it says that, is that I've extended the honeymoon period for people where I've been able to keep blood sugars normal. So if we can keep a blood sugar at around 83 in an adult uh, all day long, we seem to achieve a reduction in insulin requirements over time if we catch the diabetes early. So if you start off with high blood sugars and uh, you rapidly correct the blood sugars and keep them normal, you can preserve beta cell function. Uh, just uh, switching between basal and bolus insulin or whatnot uh, is not the answer. You could read my book for all the things that have to be done that include diet. And uh, if you can keep your blood sugar at 83, that's, that's the ultimate test. Um, and in the, in the majority of cases where we're able to do this, the insulin requirements either go down or stay put without increasing. That is, we preserve the so-called honeymoon period. What do you recommend that vegetarians do to follow the dietary guidelines you provided in your book? Apart from eggs, cheese, 
lentils and beans, how do we substitute for meat in every meal? Well, first of all, I certainly do not uh, recommend lentils and beans. So I would recommend that you read my book, Diabetes Solution. And um, the lentils and beans are high in carbohydrate. They may have small amounts of protein, but uh, they have more carbohydrate than most diabetics can cope with. Um, the only thing that is left that I can think of would be uh, these high protein uh, powdered drinks, uh, of which there are many on the market. They're used by bodybuilders. You can usually get uh, whey protein, uh, egg white protein, uh, and so on. I do not recommend so soy protein drinks for most people because um, uh, they can uh, they act like a female sex hormone. Um, the uh, there's one potential hazard to these powdered drinks. Those that are not made in California are not regulated for purity. And uh, a number of these powdered drinks have been found to contain contaminants, including, including poisonous substances. Uh, but the state of California in the USA has a law that requires a certain, uh, uh, certain uh, testing and quality control and so on. So if it's made in California, it's probably uh, more likely to be safe. Next question. What are your tips for exercising in the morning and treatment used to avoid spikes in blood sugar? I already take one unit of insulin as soon as I wake up to avoid a rise. But when I exercise, mainly running or cycling, it shoots up. Let's see what else he or she says. Well, this is a reflection of the dawn phenomenon. And it's not a surprise. I've seen this over and over. I've talked about this on the teleseminar uh, and on my Diabetes University uh, sessions. Uh, one of my very first patients uh, would, get, uh, would run every morning. He was an insulin-dependent diabetic, and if he uh, and we took care of the blood sugar rise from the running by giving him a shot of our fastest-acting insulin at the time, which was regular insulin. He got two units of regular insulin on a rising, and after breakfast he'd go running. He also got insulin for breakfast, so um, and that worked. Uh, so this person is doing the same thing and uh, uh, until this new insulin traceba came along we had uh, nothing really to combat the dawn phenomenon except either taking your basal insulin uh, early in the morning several hours before you get up or uh, injecting a rapid acting insulin on arising and in uh, the case of this questioner, uh, the rapid acting insulin is doing the job. So that's one way of hitting it. Another way, if let's see, is it a, it's a female, if she wants to try it, is to um, try the traceba twice a day. And uh, uh, it'll be lasting into the morning. And maybe she could get away with exercising in the morning. Do you still recommend R alpha lipoic acid and also sold on the uh, also sold on a brand name Insulo and evening primrose oil? You mentioned it in the book, but haven't mentioned it in your teleseminars when talking about supplements to lower blood sugar. Well, I've never I don't mention it in the book, to my knowledge, to talk about lowering blood sugar. I mention it in the book for the treatment of uh, certain neuropathies like gastroparesis uh, that take a long time to treat. 
um, and that can uh, indirectly affect your blood sugar. So uh, for my money, it's a trial and error because the reported trials have been with very large doses, especially intravenous dosing, and um, uh, they've been of only academic value, uh, not, not a practical solution. Uh, it's a lot easier uh, to use insulin <laughs> than to give intravenous uh, alpha lipoic acid. Um, so uh, I would only recommend it uh, as an option for people who have gastroparesis that is not fully responding to the other treatments that we recommend. Um, uh, by the way, a niacin deficiency can cause uh, neuropathy, so we frequently check uh, uh, niacin level, um, and uh, then if it's low, we, we may give some niacin replacement for someone uh, with uh, neuropathy. Uh, I'm sorry, not niacin, magnesium, my mistake. Uh, we check red blood cell magnesium uh, if someone has gastroparesis, and uh, we may give it to add to the other treatments that we use. The alpha lipoic acid can be added, but it's, in my experience, not a powerful addition. I mentioned in several places that there was one patient who tried it on his own and claimed that it cured his gastroparesis. But that's one opinion. I had no way of verifying it because he was from another country, so I couldn't do an RR study on him. So uh, it's nothing that I'm pushing, but it's worth experimenting with if you have gastroparesis. You add it to all the other treatments. Next question. I would like to know the challenges of diabetes which can be simplified through IT solutions. Um, <laughs> that means using some sort of device to tell you what to do or to automatically uh, adjust whatever medications you get, you're getting. And the closest thing to anything of that sort other than a blood sugar meter uh, is uh, the 24-hour glucose monitors which I prescribe uh, for only two purposes, for picking up hypoglycemia at night. If you're sleeping alone in a bed and, uh, or if you're sleeping with someone who doesn't wake up when you get hypoglycemia, uh, it's to pick up low blood sugars at night and sound an alarm. And we've spoken about that before. Another reason for using a 24-hour glucose monitor is uh, if you're in, if you have a display on a wristwatch or something, and you get in the habit of frequently looking at the watch, you may uh, get an advance warning of uh, blood sugars going down or up that you would not otherwise be aware of. There's actually a third application. Uh, many people who want to show off what they've accomplished with uh, the regimen described in my book, Diabetes Solution, are uh, publishing the uh, graphical printouts from their self-monitoring equipment, from their 24-hour monitoring equipment on the internet and showing what can be done if you cut carbohydrate and do all the other things I recommend. And these people uh, are showing uh, their roller coaster blood sugars before and then the straight line level blood sugars after they've followed our regimen and uh, this is a very nice application for the device uh, you can see it at um, type 1 one grit g-r-i-t on facebook and uh, it's a nice application uh, any other automatic devices that adjust your insulin or tell you what to do are phony. Almost uh, virtually everything I've seen 
has uh, advocated high carbohydrate, eat whatever you want, and then adjust the insulin uh, to supposedly match what you ate, which is impossible. And um, what happens is these people do not have anything approaching normal blood sugars, uh, but they fall prey to the claims of the American Diabetes Association that a hemoglobin A1C of anywhere from six and a half to seven and a half is normal, or uh, or eight or nine for elderly people is normal, and this is an absolute lie. Uh, so here you have people using insulin pumps and all kinds of machinery and getting an A1C of seven, which is an average blood sugar of about 180, which is more than double normal. Uh, I've never seen a well-controlled patient using uh, any of these devices uh, for more than um, uh, a year or two. Uh, what happens with the pumps is if you give a pump to a very mild diabetic who's making a lot of his own insulin, it's really his own insulin production that's helping keep his blood sugars controlled. And uh, the insulin pump uh, causes scar tissue to form so that eventually the in injection sites don't work anymore. And uh, as you start burning out your beta cells, uh, the algorithms in the pump, don't, which really don't work to begin with, uh, become worthless because you're not making your own insulin to, to automatically fill in. So th there really are no IT solutions right now, except for that 24-hour monitor, which can be very handy, yet is not accurate. It could be off by 20% in the readings. Okay, let's see. As the nerves regrow in my feet, I can feel an intense burn between my two front teeth. No dentist can figure out what's wrong. Could this be caused by nerve regrowth? My A1C has been below five for two years. Well, usually neuropathies uh, begin distally, that is, furthest from the brain. So you start with the toes and work your way upward. And to have a neuropathy uh, between the teeth is very unusual. In fact, I would think that long before that, you would have severe gastroparesis, which would uh, prevent blood sugar control if you're taking insulin. And uh, therefore, uh, you wouldn't have an A1C below 5 uh, because that poor blood sugar control. So this is a real puzzlement. You might uh, find out which of your dentists has a uh, CT uh, uh, device for scanning the head and uh, looking to see if there are any... Uh, physical abnormalities uh, amongst the cranial nerves. Maybe a nerve is being compressed. Uh, maybe a nerve is looped around a blood vessel or a blood vessel is looped around a nerve. I just don't know. Uh, uh, it's hard to believe that um, you had a neuropathy between your teeth that's now getting better and therefore hurting you. Um, something else I, I think is going on. If you ever find out what it is, uh, email Steve Freed at diabetesincontrol.com, publisher at diabetesincontrol.com. Let him know what it turned out to be, and he'll let me know because I'm very curious. I am a pre-diabetic. How aggressive should I be in trying to get the numbers to hover around 83? And what order should I try any treatments? Well, that was, this was the purpose of my book, Diabetes Solution, to step-by-step step cover what you do for what degree of severity of diabetes 
and uh, it's all there. Uh, we start with diet. Uh, we go into weight loss. We go into exercise. We go into um, oral uh, agents that are used to treat blood sugar. We go into um, uh, insulin use, etc. We cover all the bases. So that's what you should read. Uh, to tell you that right now would take me at least a day. Okay, next question. You mentioned cycloset in your book and say that you will wait five years before deciding whether to use it, if it is safe. Have you used it considering a study showing it's safe for the heart? Well, I wasn't that concerned about heart safety. I was concerned about uh, safety in the nervous system, especially the central nervous system. Um, a cycloset is a bromocryptine agonist that's uh, similar to what's used to treat Parkinson's disease. And, it, uh, and bromocryptine can have potent adverse effects. You have to be very careful with its use. You have to monitor blood levels, et cetera, et cetera. So um, it can be pretty tricky. And I'm just afraid to take a central nervous system drug and use it for treating diabetes uh, when I have so many other alternatives. So the chances are that uh, I, I may never uh, try it. I may find a situation where I have no other choice, and that would give me an opportunity to use it. But um, I might uh, have to uh, have the patient seeing a neurologist to do whatever follow-up tests uh, may be necessary periodically uh, to keep track of any side effects. And I'm not talking about cardiac side effects. Next question. I just read your book and want to try the diet. Most of your recipes, no, no. In some of your recipes, you recommend the GG Scandinavian brand crackers. What gluten-free substitute do you recommend? I am sensitive to gluten. Uh, if you want crackers, I would recommend the cheese puffs, which are easily made. Uh, from one slice of pasteurized processed cheese or processed cheddar or American cheese. Um, I no longer recommend uh, the bran crackers because so many of the type 1 patients have gastroparesis and the bran crackers make uh, digestion much more difficult if you have gastroparesis. And quite honestly, uh, they do not provide any nutrition. They're, they're just uh, something to munch on that's relatively benign, has a little bit of carbo. But uh, I think that nowadays, especially since the cheese puffs, we have less, than a, less of a purpose for using bran crackers. I am a 68-year-old woman diagnosed with metabolic syndrome. Recent news suggests artificial sweeteners raise blood sugars and cause other health issues. Do you think artificial sweeteners alter our blood glucose and are otherwise harmful? Uh, <clears throat> this person is probably uh, scanning the internet and you can find comments by uh, non-authoritative sources on almost any subject taking almost any side of an argument. And in this particular situation, I think that um, uh, the myths that have been created about artificial sweeteners uh, are mythical. <laughs> For example, <clears throat> uh, equal tablets. Uh, contain an agent called aspartame, an amino acid, which uh, can be metabolized to methanol 
which is uh, a, a potent is a poison. In fact, uh, uh, during prohibition, uh, many of the stills were making methanol instead of ethanol, and people were dying and going blind. But uh, the amount that you might get in a week of diet soda sweetened with aspartame compared to uh, one glass of milk, uh, you'd probably get more methanol from the metabolism of one glass of milk and, and maybe one or two carrots than you would from a week of uh, diet soda taken five times a day. So, uh, and the liver clears away these minute amounts of methanol. Uh, so there are these myths that uh, permeate uh, the internet, and uh, I've seen no hard evidence showing any effect of uh, really artificial sweeteners on blood sugar. But you can take things like uh, sorbitol, which you may or may not cause an artificial sweetener. It's, it's the alcohol of glucose. Many people call it a natural sweetener because it's so close to glucose. And it raises blood sugar gram for gram, almost the same as glucose, but more slowly. However, it has only one third the sweetening power, so you have to give three times as much, so it will raise the blood sugar at least twice as much as the same amount of sucrose or table sugar. Uh, uh, so, uh, again, these things are, uh, for the most part, mythical. And uh, stay away from sorbitol, stay away from most sugar alcohols. The chewing gum that contains xylitol uh, actually may be slightly beneficial, beneficial for uh, uh, killing bacteria in the mouth, but if you have too much of it, you'll raise your blood sugar. So I usually tell my patients who chew gum, limit yourself to three sticks of the one gram carbo per gum uh, per day, uh, etc. And for kids, uh, maybe three half sticks. Uh, but that's talking about sorbitol or xylitol, not talking about aspartame or Splenda. Now, all of the powdered sweeteners, except for stevia, are mostly sugar. They are mislabeled. So if you take uh, uh, Sweet and Low or Splenda powdered sweeteners, they are all 96% of one sugar or another. Um, uh, until recently, the favorite uh, bulking sugar was glucose. That's what they most of them used. Um, uh, so uh, these powdered sweeteners uh, are still mostly sugar, uh, 96%. Uh, we have the American Diabetes Association uh, signing a contract with Domino Sugar where they make Domino Sugar their official sweetener. They, uh, Domino has mixed it 50-50, 50 50-50, 50% with... Um, uh, stevia uh, to, uh, calling it a non-nutritive sweetener or something like that and saying it's safe for diabetics when of course it isn't because it's 50% cane sugar um, and uh, so the, the, the hazard is really in the sugars not in the artificial sweeteners I might add one other thing that even stevia is being sold two ways. There's the uh, expensive stevia, which is in a small jar and is 100% stevia. And then there's the cheapo stevia, which is in a great big jar and is sold at a lower price and is mostly sugar. Have any of your patients been pregnant while following your diet? And if so, what if any changes did you make to their diet or supplements while preparing for pregnancy? 
Um, the only thing that I can think of offhand that uh, is really sort of universal is the use of a, um, a, a pregnancy multivitamin containing iron, such as Materna. And um, uh, these preparations are available by prescription and therefore insurance will pay for them. It's possible to put together the equivalent non-prescription, but if you want your insurance to pay for it uh, while you're pregnant, uh, Materna and similar products would be appropriate. Have you had experience with fecal transplants and would you recommend them? If your patients have had them, did it make any difference to their blood sugars? Well, <laughs> this is a science that's uh, experimental and is geared for certain very special situations like perhaps Crohn's disease and a few other things. Uh, it's not being used to treat diabetes, and I'm not using it to treat diabetes, and I've never met a person, uh, a patient or otherwise, who's had a fecal transplant. So if you're looking to control blood sugars, I suggest you read my book, Diabetes Solution. Next question. Type 1 uh, for three years. Now 33. In the past, if I did vigorous exercise, my blood sugar would immediately come down. Now they seem to go up for a certain period of time before going down. What accounts for the change? Would this only be due to less endogenous insulin production? Right on the nose. Uh, if you have type 1 diabetes, uh, initially you're making some insulin. And, uh, and in most cases, they call that the dawn phenomenon. And if you keep your blood sugars absolutely normal with the help of insulin and all the other things we tell about, talk about in our book, um, uh, you can preserve the dawn phenomenon. Now, this is sort of a wild claim because most doctors are not preserving it, but I've seen this over and over. Um, but if you don't keep your blood sugars normal, uh, glucose is toxic to beta cells, and uh, there are other reasons why high blood sugars uh, bring about uh, loss of beta cell function. Uh, eventually, you're, you'll be uh, either totally without your beta cells or they'll be not functioning as well, and that's what's happening here. What is your take on the idea that type 2 diabetes is caused by fat in the liver and pancreas which inhibits insulin release, and that losing enough visceral fat in those organs restores insulin secretion in a percentage of patients diagnosed within four years or less. Uh, I'll tell you what we know that's for real, and the way it's worded in this question is not quite the way it is. What we see is that abdominal obes obesity uh, actually what's called mesenteric fat, fat that's uh, below the muscle layer and covering the material, the membrane that covers your intestines. And so here your intestinal area is surrounded by fat. That causes inflammation. And it's the inflammation that causes uh, damage to beta cells that... Uh, brings about type 2 diabetes. Uh, there have been many studies on this, and the number of inflammatory markers that have been uncovered in this phenomenon uh, are legion. There, there are many of them. It's a very complicated process, uh, but that is basically the, the scenario. I'm following your book's diet. I have uremia and elevated cholesterol. What changes should I make to decrease them both? Well, first of all, uh, this person may be just reading my, my book, Diabetes Diet, and not reading Diabetes Solution, which speaks about medications that you may need 
uh, and how to keep blood sugars normal. So we do now elevated cholesterol, as I pointed out before, is not a risk factor in and of itself, but um, it does go down when you normalize blood sugars. Also, um, uh, normalizing uh, serum free T3 uh, triiodothyronine levels uh, improves, uh, lowers cholesterol. Uh, but the uremia, which is serum uric acid levels, could be due to advanced kidney disease, could be due to uh, an inherited metabolic defect that frequently causes gout. So the a game plan should be to find out why do you have uremia. If you have end-stage kidney disease, is it due to diabetes or to what else? And, and it should be treated. Um, so the game plan should be to find out the cause of your uremia. Um, that's basically it. Uh, they do tell people who have gout to avoid organ meats and certain other foods. Uh, but uh, if you have gout, you should be seeing a rheumatologist who specializes in gout, and he'll tell you that information. There are also medications for gout. Uh, do you know if doctors in Cuba practice better diabetes treatment than our doctors in the U.S.? Well, that's a very good question. I don't know the answer to it, but I wouldn't be surprised because the guidelines in the U.S. require uh, inadequate treatment. Let's see now. In your book, you assert that intense exercise generates new telomeres and thereby prolongs life. Are there any other studies that available that relate to this? There are many. And uh, we have a, a file folder full of such studies. Um, over the years, I've sent copies to Steve Freed, but I doubt that uh, he's uh, going to want to hunt through his files. What I'd suggest you do is go to Google and uh, say, uh, search for scientific studies showing that exercise uh, increases number of telomeres or increase, I should say, increases length of telomeres, T-E-L-O-M-E-R-E-S. Can U100 insulin be diluted if you want to bring down sugars quickly instead of either doing an intramuscular injection or using aspart? Well, Aspart uh, goes by the brand name of Novolog. I suspect that what this patient is really asking uh, is, can you uh, use the more potent insulin, Umalog, which is more rapid acting than Novolog, but is so potent that it's very hard to measure uh, an, a, a, a precise effective dose. Uh, and yes, Umalog can be diluted. Uh, there is a diluting fluid uh, made by Lilly uh, that's free upon request from the manufacturer. The same diluting fluid is used for Umalog, for regular, uh, and for NPH insulins. Uh, so uh, that can be done. And you can, uh, uh, for example, let's say that, like me, one unit of Umalog will lower my blood sugar by 120. So if I diluted it 9 to 1 with diluting fluid, one unit would lower me 12. So if my blood sugar were elevated by 12, I could take one unit of Umalog, and it would bring me down 12. And it's rapid act, very rapid acting. And the diluted Umalog might still work more rapidly than the Novolog. But Novolog usually, frequently has to be diluted too. Uh, the situation where we don't have to dilute them is with obese or very insulin resistant people, which is another ball game altogether. 
What is your opinion about the mixed evidence linking cow's milk to type 1 diabetes? Well, uh, that was uh, originally speculation, I think, because of the high incidence of diabetes in Finland, where I think there was uh, uh, wide usage of cow's milk, possibly instead of mother's milk. I don't remember the details. Uh, this was going on a number of years ago. But I recall that studies have been done that now seem to show that cow's milk is not a cause of type 1 diabetes. Uh, you could, again, search the literature uh, for journal articles or scientific studies relating uh, cow's milk to type 1 diabetes. And what you do not want blogs and opinions and uh, uh, internet sites of so-called authorities. You want to see actual uh, uh, scientific articles in peer-reviewed journals. And I think you'll find that it's no longer believed to be the case. Well, that's it for tonight. Uh, our thanks for listening. Uh, Happy New Year to everyone. I wish that you will join us on January 27th, Wednesday, uh, for the next edition of our teleseminar. Uh, we'll be looking for you then. Thanks. Okay.